of Jerry and the Dog. Now, what I'm going to tell you has something to do with how sometimes it's necessary to go a long distance out of the way in order to come back a short distance correctly. Or maybe only think it has to do with that. But it's why I went to the zoo today, and why I walked north, normally, rather, until I came here. All right. The dog. I think I told you, is a black monster of a beast. An oversized head, tiny, tiny ears, and eyes bloodshot, infected maybe, and a body you can see the ribs through the skin. The dog is black, all black, all black except for bloodshot eyes, and yes, and an open sore on its right forepaw. Poor animal. And I do believe it's an old dog. It's certainly a misused one. Almost always has an erection. Of sorts. That's red too. <laughs> what else? Oh yes. There's a, uh, a gray, yellow, white color too. He bears his fang. Like this. <laughs> this is what he did when he saw me for the first time. The day I moved in. I worried about that animal the very first minute I met. Now, animals don't take to me like St. Francis has birds hanging off of them all the time. What I mean is, animals are indifferent. Like people. Most of the time. But this dog wasn't indifferent. From the very beginning, he'd snarl and then go for me. Like, to get one of my legs. Not like he was rabid. You know, he, uh, he was sort of a stumbly dog. But he wasn't half-assed, either. It was a good, stumbly run, but I always got away. He got a piece of my trouser leg. Look, you can see right there where it's mended. He got that the second day I lived there. But I kicked free and got up there as fast, so that was that. I still don't know to this day how the other rumors managed it. But, you know what I think? I think it had to be only with me. Cozy. So... Anyway, this went on for over a week. Whenever I came in, but never when I went out. That's funny. Or, it was funny. I could pack out the bed in the street for all the dog care. Well, I thought about it up in my room one day. One of the times after I bolted upstairs, and I made up my mind. I decided first, I'll kill the dog with kindness. And if that doesn't work, I'll just kill him. Don't react, Peter. Just listen. So the next day, I went out and bought a bag of hamburgers. Medium rare, no ketchup, no onion. And on the way home, I threw away the roll and kept just the meat. When I got back to the grooming house, the dog was waiting for me. I half opened the door to the entrance hall. And there the monster was. Wait. It figured. I went in very cautiously, and I had the hamburgers to remember. I opened the bag and set the meat down about. 12 feet from where the dog was snarling. He snarled. Stop snarling. Sniff. Move slowly, then faster, then faster toward the meat. Well, when he got to me, he stopped. He looked at me. I looked at him, but tentatively, you understand. The dog turned his face back down toward the hamburgers. Smelled. Sniffed some more. And then. <laughs> like that, he tore in. It was as if he'd never eaten anything in his life before, except, like, garbage. <laughs> Which very well might have been the truth. I don't think a landlady ever eats anything with garbage. But he ate all the hamburgers, almost all at once, making sounds in his throat like a woman. <laughs> <laughs> then, when he finished the hamburger, the meat, and tried to eat the paper, too, he sat down and he smiled. I think he smiled. I know cats do. It was a very gratifying few moments. And then he went for me again. But he didn't give me this time either. So I got upstairs and I lay down on my bed. And I started to think about the dog again. <laughs> to be truthful, I was offended. And I was damn mad too. It was six perfectly good hamburgers without enough pork in them to make it disgusting. I was offended. But 
after a while, I decided to try it for a few more days. If you think about it, this dog had what amounted to an antipathy toward me, and I wondered if I might overcome this antipathy. So, I tried it for the next five days, but it was always the same. Snarl. Stop snarling. Smell. Move slowly. Faster. Stop. Stare. Go! Smile. Snarl. Well now, by this time, Columbus Avenue was strewn with hamburger rolls, and I was less offended than disgusted. So, I decided to kill the dog. Oh, don't be so alarmed, Peter. I didn't succeed. The day I tried to kill the dog, I bought only one hamburger, and what I thought was a murderous portion of rat food. When I bought the hamburger, I asked the man not to bother with the roll. All I wanted was the meat. I expected some kind of reaction from him, like, we don't sell no hamburgers without rolls, or, what are you going to do, eat it out of your hands? <laughs> but no, he smiled benignly and wrapped the hamburger up in wax paper and said, a bite for your pussycat? I wanted to say, no, not really. It's part of a plan to poison a dog I know. <laughs> but you can't really say a dog I know without sounding funny. So I just said it a little too loud and too formally, I'm afraid. Yes, a bite for my pussycat. <laughs> People looked up. It always happens when I try to simplify things. People look up. But that's my better. So, on my way home, I needed the hamburger and the rat poison together between my hands. At that point, feeling as much sadness as disgust. When I got back to the rooming house, the dog was waiting for me. Waiting to take the offering and then jump. Poor bastard. He never learned that the minute he took the smile before he went for me, gave me time to get out of range. Well, there he was. Malevolence with an erection. Wait. I put the poison patty down. I moved cautiously toward the stairs. And watched. Poor animal gobbled down the food as usual. Smiled, which made me almost sick. And then. But he didn't get me, as usual. I got upstairs, as usual. And it came to pass that the beast was deathly ill. <laughs> I know, because he no longer attended me. And because the landlady sobered up. She stopped me the very same evening of the attempted murder and confided the information that God had struck her puppy dog a surely fatal blow. She had forgotten her bewildered lust, and her eyes were wide open for the first time. They looked like a dog's eyes. She sniveled and implored me to pray for the animal. I wanted to say to her, Madam, I have myself to pray for. The colored queen, the Puerto Rican family, the person on the third floor whom I've never seen, and the woman that cries deliberately behind her closed door, and all the rest of the people in all the rooming houses everywhere. Besides, madam, I don't understand how to pray. But, to simplify things, I told her I would pray. She looked up. She said that I was a liar, and that I probably wanted the doctor. And I told her, and there was so much truth here, that I didn't want the dog to die. I didn't. And not just because I poisoned him. I'm afraid I must tell you that I wanted the dog to live so that I could see what our new relationship might come to. Please understand, Peter. That sort of thing is important. You must believe me, it is important. We have to know the effect of our actions. Anyway, the dog recovered. I have no idea why, unless he was a descendant of the puppy that guarded the gate of hell or some such resort. <coughs> I'm not up on my mythology again, are you? At any rate, and you've missed the $8,000 question here. At any rate, the dog recovered his health, 